If you're watching this video, it's a good chance that there's some type of protest or riots going on in France right now. Well, the unrest broke out in several cities, notably in Marseille, in the south of the country. Video footage showing streets on fire and shops, including a gun store, being attacked and looted by rioters. Maybe you're asking yourself why this keeps happening and how Paris is basically being burned down every time. Now I'm not going to say it's such a bad thing because protesting has actually given France what it has today. Quality of life. Did you know that protesting is deeply embedded in French culture? And we need to go back centuries to see just how important it is for French people. Back in the medieval period, there was a common form of street protest called charivari. Local communities used to go outside to the houses of people accused of moral offenses, such as adultery, for example, bang on pots and pans and demand the accused be punished, perhaps by running them out of town or forcing them to pay a bit of money to the assembled crowd. Over time, Chattavaris grew increasingly political and the houses of unpopular officials often targeted, sometimes even leading to murder. Then they were the subsistence riots of the late 1700s, caused by abnormal weather events leading to bad harvests, combined with mismanagement of resources and wealth inequality. These riots were a survival tactic to obtain food at a fair price. They also had a political element, as they responded to a perceived failure of the government to do its job. The people rioted in support of the parliament, which ultimately led to the French Revolution that toppled the monarchy and gave rise to the First French Republic in 1792. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen were proclaimed followed by the country's first constitution and, of course, an iconic beheading of King Louis XVI. Basically, modern France was built on rebellion. Even after democracy replaced monarchy, the culture of the masses taking their anger against perceived inequality onto the streets of Paris never changed. Two more revolutions, because of similar issues, followed in 1830 and 1848, leading to a second French Republic. The memory of these revolutions, as well as other uprisings, have been imprinted on the French nation forever. Even Napoleon III, fearing such protests, could threaten his grip on power literally reconstructed Paris to be optimized for stopping uprisings between 1853 and 1870. Let me explain. You see, before the heart of Paris was basically a maze of notoriously narrow streets, uprisings had a habit of barricading neighborhoods, and there wasn't much the army or police could do about it. So as a result, Napoleon III decided to replan the narrow streets of Paris into wide, easily accessible boulevards. That's how you end up with this before and after. They thought this would stop the building of barricades that hindered soldiers from restoring order by hiding the protesters and would be very easy to march entire regiments of troops. Even many of the new roads built during Haussmann's renovations of Paris cut through traditionally radical neighborhoods to divide and displace the population in an attempt to separate them and prevent revolutionary street action. It's all explicit by design. Much of modern Paris was born from the desire to stop protests. But this, of course, didn't work completely. Because in 1871, La Commune, another insurrection led by the working classes, planted the seeds of women's emancipation, freedom of the press, and secularism. See, there is a general conviction that revolt is necessary when you do not agree with the government, and, to be fair, it's worked insanely well as we've seen even in the modern day. If you want to know why France is famous for their high quality of life and fewer hours at work than many other nations, take a look no further than their two defining protests of the 1900s. The first being in 1936 was organized to commemorate La Commune after the left-wing party Popular Front. One election and gathered an extraordinary 600,000 people triggering massive strikes across the country. It was so powerful that the union's demands were quickly met by the government who signed what are known as the Martinian Agreements. And unions, by the way, are quite a special thing in France, which we'll get to in a bit. Anyways, this Matinéon Agreement was a huge victory for the working classes. Salaries were raised across the board. The working week went from 48 hours to 40, and two weeks of paid holidays were made into law. The nationalization of public services, such as the railways, was also well underway. The second protest in 1968 had students at Sorbonne University protesting to challenge the status quo. 
The violence that the authorities used to suppress the protesters, though, led France's trade union confederations to call for sympathy strikes, which spread far more quickly than expect to involve 11 million workers. More than 22% of the total population of France at the time, making it the largest general strike ever in the country. Of course, again, the results speak for themselves. The uprising led to a rise in the minimum wage by 35% and salary increases of 10%. It also undermined the legitimacy of President Charles de Gaulle, who stood down the following year. Once again, in the eyes of many, protests had led to the betterment of the lives of ordinary French families. Now the unions I talked about in France are quite different, to the rest of the world both being strong and weak at the same time. On one hand, unions are weak in the way that they have low membership. Only about 8% of the working population today are members of a union compared to the European average of 25%. This is because in France, and unlike many other countries, striking is an individual civil rights unrelated to whether you're a union member or not. I mean, after all, the French won the right to strike in 1864, 20 years before they were even allowed to unionize. Striking was a first result, and to some extent, that's still in the muscle memory. The French distrust of politics and authority also extends to unions, too. But on the other hand, unions are extremely powerful because under French law, they basically get a huge stake in how companies are managed. Let me explain. So the unions are joint managers along with business representatives of the country's health and social security system and as employee representatives in the workplace. Under French law, elected union delegates represent all employees, union members or not. In firms with over 50 staff members on both work councils and separate half and safety councils. This gives trade unions a daily say in the running of companies across the private sector, which accounts for the real strength of their voice. And the thing is, because they get their power from these favorable laws, which theoretically could be repealed at any time, they're more willing to fight any policy they don't like now because they might not be able to fight in the future. Managements are aware of this weakness, so they begin any negotiations by taking a pretty hard line. This, in turn, incentivizes unions to make huge protests rather than trying to work it out at the negotiating table. And thus we have a cycle. I mean, after all, France has had a strike every year since 1947, an impressive strike that they'll probably never lose or stop extending, of course. So this brings us to today. It also helps that the French government subsidizes food and health care. So when time comes to strike, people are in a position where they can take time off work. Whereas if you compare that to the U.S., for example, many workers can't afford to. In the end, huge recent protests like the Yellow Vest movements, which is for more or less the same reasons as all, the others all draw influence from the past. Many critics have said that it doesn't make sense for the French to essentially be on standby for protests or violence at all times when they have things so good in comparison to everyone else. But this is exactly why things are better in France. Because they see the power in collective action and demand change. If there's stagnant wages, they smash up a bank. Elitist education policies, they burn some cars. Whatever needs to be done will be done. Even where protests have failed, France's protest culture has made controversial laws harder and slower to pass and forced presidents to pay the price for upsetting the public. It's for this reason that today, although protests may create inconveniences for the French people as a whole, a large proportion of the public are often supporting or cooperating with a striker, and there's no sign this will ever stop. Thanks for watching. Subscribe and click the notification bell for more history videos. I really appreciate your support on this YouTube channel. Let's keep it growing and thank you for being part of this amazing community. Thank you, bro.